Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Today is our last episode of A Nation of Immigrants in 2022. Last week, this show received a Show of the Year Award from Singten, Hawaii. We want to thank our colleagues, Mike in particular, and Jay and Haley and Eric at Singten, Hawaii for your hard work and the recognition. Every other week, we started this show with this famous quote from President Reagan. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in German, Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk or Japanese, but anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. This program features the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion created by Singtan Hawaii and the Kingsfield Law Office. We invite renowned immigrants and descendants of immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and the contributions to cultural diversity. Today's guest is our very good friend, Professor Varin Mercy. Welcome, Varin. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's our honor. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read a very short bio of you, and I will have some questions for you. Sure. Dr. Varin Murphy is a professor in the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He teaches transnational Asian history and researches Chinese and the Japanese intellectual history. He's the author of The Political Philosophy of Zhang Taiyan, The Resistance of Consciousness and co-editor of The Challenge of Linear Time, Nationhood and the Politics of History in East Asia, and co-editor of A Companion to Global Historical Thought. He has published articles in Modern Intellectual History, Modern China, Frontiers of History in China, and Positions Asian Critique, and is currently working on a project, Pan-Asianism and the Conundrum of Post-Colonial Modernity. By pure serendipity, Professor Murphy received his PMA in philosophy from the University of Hawaii and his PhD in history from the University of Chicago. Thank you so much for agreeing to be our distinguished guest, uh, Murphy. This is our last episode in 2022. I'm so thrilled to have you because you are my favorite historian who studied intellectual history of China. We will get to that part momentarily, but uh, please tell us how your family settled in the United States. Okay, um, so my father, my, my father and mother are both were from uh, South India, right? So my father grew up in Hyderabad. Uh, my mother is from well, originally Tamilian, but grew up around India and various places. Um, but my father came to the United States as a postdoc uh, at Columbia University uh, in mathematics. He's a, he's a mathematician. And my mother uh, went to Columbia as, uh, to do her uh, master's in uh, nutrition. And so they met over there, and that's how they uh, met. And then eventually, um, you know, they, they moved to Chicago, where my father um, got a job. I remember met your parents and, oh, yes. uh, in Chicago, and I remember you uh, borrowed your father's car and uh, drove me to, from Champaign to Chicago O'Hara Airport, and it was a blizzard snowstorm. I, I still remember that. I think I, I'm deeply in your debt, and I hope <laughs> I can repay your, your generosity and, and the tremendous friendship you know uh, sometimes so well oh, yes and i think i i met you in, in champagne urbana right and yes, uh, but yes, when yes. i met you we we were both uh, you know uh, grew up but i was curious about your childhood what was it like to grow up in chicago and as an indian american second generation so but your parents are academics so what was it like to grow up in Chicago with your academic parents as a second generation immigrant? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it was a little bit um, 
sometimes a little confusing because I did not uh, just grow. I was born in Chicago. We moved back mm -hmm. to India when I was about two weeks old, uh, oh. and then I came back. I came back when we were came back when I was five. Uh, I think we moved back around when I was ten, and then I came back when I was sixteen. So I think there was a constant sort of negotiation between the two cultures, um, mm -hmm. and I think that was really what characterized i mean often feeling that you don't fit in in either place right and i think that i think was the um i think what what often characterized my childhood yeah that's a that's what we typically say living in parallel universes and it could be yeah, an advantage yes. because you can see you you become the sort of a bridge between these two cultures at least in your own circle on the other hand, I fear that people like you and I, I, I didn't move back and forth when I was a kid. But uh, uh, in my 30s, I just spent half time in China, half time in the United States. And I end yes. up like, you know, um, this, this joke, self-deprecating joke, I always tell my friends, including you and Yu Hong, mm -hmm. that my Chinese friends think I'm too, too American to be Chinese, and my, my American friends think I'm too American to Chinese to be American. And what's your comment mm -hmm. on that? Living into yeah. parallel universes? No, I think I think that's very much um, how I felt. But, but I think with India and um, the United States, there might be a slight difference. I think because when I went to India and I went to high school in India, being American came with a certain symbolic capital. You know, a lot mm. of people want to know about America. Oh, yeah, what's the new thing? You know, what's the new music they're listening to and, and this and that. Mm. And uh, so I would have a, and I didn't always fit into American society, but I was trying, I became more American when I went to India. Because, you know, once I go to India, I got to, tr I try to, you know, use that. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, I know all about America, you know, that kind <laughs> yes. of thing. And then. And then I come back, right? And so, because we really moved back when I was 16 and we didn't go back again to India. Then, you know, what I noticed, I mean, any in the US, and this was the 1980s, uh, it might be slightly different now. There wasn't that among the high school students and so on. There's not, no one really is interested in India. I mm. mean, uh, so, you, so all the, anything that you have, like I'm, I have, yeah, always had an interest in Indian music. And uh, <clears throat> nobody's interested in that. I mean, there's no. Um, so, so that I think is a very the the global inequality uh, is quite quite significant. Um, mm -hmm. China today is a little bit different because there are there is an interest in China from the from the side of the government for various reasons. For, um, but still, I still think it's different. Like you go to China and you can find you know, a lot of stuff on, you know, American culture and so on, this and that. But you can't really find, it's not the same in, in terms of the US, right? In terms mm -hmm. of their, you know, popular culture and so on. I don't think it's, it's China plays that big of a role, yeah. yeah. Very, very good comment. Uh, last week, um, some, of my, some of my students were debating whether or not China could replace the United States as a number one or superpower. And the debate inevitably leads to the, the discussion of soft power, meaning the cultural power. And it appears that at least in the United States, the Korean culture is much more powerful and, and super than the other Asian cultures. And, but I, I would see, uh, also argue that the Indian culture has uh, played a very significant role in the American uh, society right now. And uh, it probably is a quite different from when you were a, a child. Do you agree? Indian culture has um, more and more. Could you say a little, could you say a little more about where you see the Indian culture uh, playing a role? I mean, I can see a little bit of Bollywood and stuff, but yeah, I don't know. Bollywood and politics. And uh, well, obviously that will be Indian American, but uh, I, I, have, I see Indian restaurants everywhere. And would that be yeah, too there's Indian restaurants. That is not really. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean that is nothing like. I mean, think about when I was in nineteen in China in nineteen ninety five. Think mm -hmm. about the amount of people who went to see the movie Titanic. Nice. Um, you know, I just don't think you have that level. I think um, 
China would love to have that level of influence in, a, in the United States. But I think we're still, it needs a long more, lot more time. There's something about Hollywood because it's not just, it's not just one country like China, but it's the rest of the world too. Like mm -hmm. um, certain things like Madonna and so on, it's just all over. You go to you know, Hong Kong, India, you can hear that name. But I don't think we have something similar with respect to like a really important singer or something like that in, in China. I mean, who would be the symbol? I mean, Wang Fei or someone like that. I mean, I don't yeah. think you, you act to most Americans. Yeah, who is that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, so. I agree. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, you met, you have a strong uh, interest in China. Obviously, his yes. wife is a Chinese American. Professor Yu Hong, yes. a terrific art historian. And yes, uh, yes, yes. we've been family friends for decades. But uh, tell me how you two met and what uh, shared academic interest you have and brought you together. Well, uh, so we met in around, I think, 1992. And um, I was in Beijing as an exchange student. Um, and at that time, that was when I was in Hawaii, actually. Um, I was in Hawaii and uh, in, in uh, you know, philosophy department at, uh, at the University of Hawaii, and I got a fellowship to go to China to study, I think, both Chinese and about Chinese philosophy. And so I was there in Beijing University, and she was working at the Beijing Art Museum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Wan Shou Si, which is yes. not too far from, from Beijing University. And, uh, and so we met, we met there. Um, the actual circumstances was I was actually, there was a, a class for, um, you know, people who wanted to learn like conversational English, and I was teaching that. And, and she, came, she came to just sort of see what it was like. And, and so we met over there. Lovely story. I, I, I love the museum. The museum is just absolutely fantastic. And uh, I remember, and your wife worked at uh, the Nature Field Museum in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, gave us a fantastic tour. <laughs> well, yeah, and yeah, yeah. let's focus on your uh, research. And uh, you had a, a master degree in philosophy and a doctor yes. degree in history. And uh, could you yes. just tell our audience and uh, what was your main focus and what, what project you're working on? So and you did publish uh, the article, you did publish a book about Zhang Taiyan. I doubt that yes. many educated Americans ever heard of Zhang Taiyan before. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, um, so my first uh, degree was in philosophy, right? My master's, I took a master's in philosophy in Hawaii, and there I was very interested in comparative philosophy. So, mm -hmm. China and and uh, and the West. And then I, you know, and I, I guess, um, so I was trained as a philosopher, and then I switched to doing history. And um, I did, um, I went to Chicago to do my PhD in history. Uh, and I did intellectual history, because I, in many ways, I'm like a philosopher masquerading as a historian. Um, so I'm in a history department <laughs> yeah, now, but, I I, but what I... What I often do is basically more philosophy. And so, yeah, I worked on, I did my dissertation and my first book was on um, uh, Zhang Taiyan, who is a revolutionary um, uh, thinker in the you know, early 20th century, late Qing period. And what I found really interesting about him is his reading of Yogacara Buddhism, um, mm. which he used in order to develop a kind of critique of Western modernity, right? So, uh, and he was also, of course, very uh, influential in terms of the 1911 revolution, which is often called the Republican Revolution. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the more famous person there, of course, is uh, Sun Zhongshan or Sun Yat-sen. Um, but he was also part of that. And that's how people know Jiang Taiyan. But I wanted to uncover really his more philosophical side, you know, his critique of what of the institutions of modernity, such as the state or evolution and so on. Um, so I, I've always been interested in sort of, you know, uh, Asian intellectuals using their tradition to sort of reflect critically on modernity. So mm -hmm. my next, my second book, it was is on, um, which just came out this year, it's called uh, 
I think it's called um, The Politics of Time in China and Japan, Back to the Future. Uh, and there also I talk a little bit about um, ja, uh, John Dayan, but I mean, the basic idea when I, I use the term back to the future, of course, making reference to that old movie, but yes, but, yes. Uh, but also this idea that, you know, all these people who want to go back to tradition, I mean, they're going back to the tradition, but they're often doing so to go to a different future, a future that is bad, better than the one. Mm. that they um, see today and that's often connected to you know issues of capitalism and so on yeah that's fascinating that's absolutely fascinating you know Zhang Taiyan is uh, uh, was obviously a very important figure in modern Chinese history and there uh, and cast a huge influence uh, in modern China so same as Zhang Taiyan there were Liang Jichao there were you know uh, Hu Shi there were Lu Xun, and there were many, many intellectuals in China, and uh, uh, you know, clustered during the May Fourth New Cultural Movement. And so, I have, I do have a question: Did these influencers really make a difference in Chinese history or the direction of China? But because look, look, looking back, nineteen nineteen, the May Fourth Movement, the two major goals were democracy, Mister Democracy, and Mister Science. And a yeah. hundred years later, uh, we are still trying to invite these two gentlemen uh, mm. to show up. <laughs> uh, did did the, the, this group of, may I add, true patriots, you know, Zhang Taiyan, Zhang Liang Jichao, Hu Shi, they are true patriots, try to make, uh, make a difference, try to uh, lead China out of this vicious circle. But a hundred years later, what's your ju judgment? What, what did they really make a difference? Well, I think that we have to realize that it's not just these um, intellectuals, right? Because, um, I mean, did they make a difference? Of course they made a difference, I think. Uh, the question is, what difference did they make, I mm -hmm. think, is the issue. Because if you think about it, I mean, the 1911 revolution actually happened. Uh, we can't say that that wasn't, that, that wasn't a revolution. And I think if we go even further, um, we can say you, you then go to Mao Zedong and the whole 1949 revolution. Now, that's also a major event in history. Uh, you have land reform, you have all of those things, um, and you have the attempt to create a different type of system, uh, you know, and that, of course, is the whole socialist experiment in, that, that China so so well known for. Um, and the question then becomes, yeah, where, where is democracy? I mean, because science, I think there's very little doubt that China has done, you know, quite uh, well in terms of science. There's so much, many great scientists. I mean, even just mathematicians, given that's, my father was a mathematician. And so you could, there were a lot of Chinese, very famous Chinese mathematicians and same today. But democracy is another story, right? I mean, democracy is of course the problem of you know you know it's de democratic centralization is what they often talked about it right in in the in the in the in the communist party and it, it's very interesting to see mao himself sort of wrestling with that right because some would you know during the uh cultural revolution mao himself is saying oh no no we want big democracy uh mm -hmm. and people don't have enough um you know, um, rights to criticize their superiors, and you had all kinds of criticisms going on, you know. Uh, um, and yet, um, the whole idea of radical democracy that is there in Mao couldn't, was never actually institutionalized, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so then we're now back to today where, you know, we're still asking the same questions. But I think it's very important to put this in a global context. Because I don't think that the problem of democracy has been solved around the world in, in, in other places either, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the, the one of the fundamental problems of democracy is precisely that, you know, the common people um, don't always have the power um, to govern the conditions of their lives, right? They what they have to do is delegate that to pol politicians, but they can't often choose which politicians run for, for government. And so then they're 
there becomes what you know a kind of lack of interest in democracy and voting and so on right mm -hmm. very insightful and that leads to the fundamental question we have is modernization equals westernization and because some of the uh, history, history books I, I read you probably disagree that uh, argued that china is trapped in this pre-modern state voluntarily or involuntarily and uh, because china refused totally rebut the idea of total westernization and what was your comment on that well that's a very interesting question um and it actually gets to another uh book that i'm working on mm. um and and quite and pretty close to finishing and, and should be out next year um and it is called uh, um pan-asianism and uh the legacy of the chinese revolution and uh, one of the key figures in that book is um, a person by the name of Takeuchi Yoshimi. And yes. one of the things he really writes about is precisely this problem of Chinese modernity. And, um, you know, I, I mean, and, and it also gets to the question that you're talking about in terms of, you know, is modernization westernization? And he wants to say, no, it has, I mean, one hopes that it isn't. because. If it is, then all countries have to become Western, even the Asian countries. So, um, so that what he ends up saying is that what happens in China um, is a kind of dialectic that, you know, the refusal for uh, Western modernity and so on or towards in, at the beginning leads to a different path of, of, of modernity, right? Um, but I think another part of that is the danger of uh, thinking about modernization as uh, a linear path. Because what that's saying is that until you're westernized, you're not modern. And then who's going to get you to be modern? Well, the, Western, well, the Westerners, right? And mm -hmm. that was, of course, what the ideology of imperialism was all the time. I mean, think about India and so on. The Britishers are there. We're going to help you become modern. We're help you become civilized, right? And I think the whole thing that, um, you know, the whole anti-colonial movement shows is precisely that there could be another version of modernization. Mm. Um, now, of course, part of this is cultural, but part of it is also uh, material conditions, right? When we're talking about India or China, we're talking about much poorer conditions. And so um, a big and a larger population, um, all of these kind of things then come in to the modernization story, right? And, and so it's obviously a story that's ongoing, right? I agree. I, I very much look forward to reading your new book. It's, it just sounds extremely, extremely uh, interesting. Uh, Japan, I would argue that Japan's uh, modernization has been quite successful. And even they maintain the monarchy. But anyway, a change of gears, uh, we have only uh, five, six minutes left, and uh, we normally conclude our show with two general questions to our distinguished guests. The question number one is, time travel permitted, if you can travel back to your early 20s, and what kind of advice you want to give yourself, a younger version of you? And both you and I are the same generation, and we have some gray hair in our heads, and uh, I, I'm very eager to hear what's your advice you want to give to a, a younger self. Well, um, I think uh, that's a very difficult question because there's so many things, um, you know, that I that I could tell. I mean, because what twenty years I'm when I'm twenty years old, I'm like still in college, mm -hmm. um, and I think the you know to put it in a large kind of um, phrase, you know, you know, just be open to the, to the opportunities that present them to, that pre present themselves to you, I think. Um, I think that's one of the, the other, the other side is to also partly say that, you know, because the thing is, when we look back, we often say there are all these mistakes we made and so on. Um, but I think it's through the mistakes that I became who I am today, right? So there's a sense in which you, it's almost that you can't change it. Um, it's so difficult to change it that, because if I changed who I was in 
you know, when I was 20 years old, I wouldn't be who I am now. And so, mm-hmm. so it becomes <laughs> a little difficult to even think about it. <laughs> That's true. Your, your good advice. Your advice just reminded me that one philosopher once said, if we were given the choice to relive our life again, we're going to do the, exactly the same thing. Exactly. And live the exactly the same life. Exactly. And I think that is Nietzsche, right? His yes. idea of the eternal return, right? That That's true. You yes. always have to do the same thing again and again. You have, if you're willing it, you will one thing, you have to will the whole thing. And so free I, will is an illusion, basically. Is it? Yeah, well, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, we can always say that things could have been otherwise, and we now have all these choices we can make. But once we start looking back, we can begin to say, see how there was a logic to where we, where we ended up, right? Very good. Um, Last question. What books and or movies you enjoy at this moment you want to uh, recommend to our audience? In addition to your books, I will highly recommend your books, <laughs> Great. particularly the book on Zhang Taiyan, which is absolutely fascinating. And what's your recommendation? Great. Well, I've just been reading some things uh, lately. I think I've been reading a book um, by Terry Pinkard called uh, Practice, Power, and Forms of Life, mm. Such a, so Appropriation of Hegel and Marx. I've been looking, I've been sort of looking at that. Um, I've also been reading uh, in the China field um, a thinker named uh, Zhao Tingyang, um, ah, who's, yes, uh, who's, yes. who's who's written whose his, his recent book has just been translated into into English called All Under Heaven. Um, mm-hmm. Apart from that, I've been interested in the um, the Indian Marxist Ajaz Ahmed, who's got a book. Uh, which is actually interviews with him and Vijay Prasad called uh, Nothing Human is Alien to Me, um, which is quite interesting. All of all these books sort of touch on my interests in different ways. Thank uh, you with, very much. Yeah. With respect anything, to TV, uh, anything a little bit lighter? Well, one TV <laughs> show is the German TV show called Cleo, uh, which tells the story of a, an agent. Yeah. So, that's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. During the Cold War. Right? Yeah, it's a quite, a, quite a good show, I thought. Yeah. All right. Good, good advice. I think that most of our audience will go to watch the TV show first, <laughs> then read the Hegel and Max. But fantastic. <laughs> well, what, what a pleasure to have you on the show, Varen. Yeah, uh, it was great to have you as well. It's a well, talk to you. Yeah, yeah it's a, thank you so much. And uh, 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 we very much look forward to continue, continue our discussion again. Sure. As I said, this is our last episode in 2022. And in 2023, we will continue to hear the stories from you, from the immigrants, from uh, descendants of immigrants, and how your contribution to the fabric of American life. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Okay. Aloha. Bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.